Let me what are we, see. three minutes? Three minutes out. Hey, Sheila, I can't use GPS to get to your house. Which way should I go? Okay, go uh, 101 North. Get okay. off. Get off on. Um, get off on Shoop. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go live on Facebook, on YouTube. I'll we'll see you All guys. All right, so let's get on 101 North while we're doing the show. Get to take a ride. Text me when we're live. I'll hit you on FaceTime right now. Huh? Should I hit you on FaceTime? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'll see you guys in a second. All right. Shit, I'll be right back too. Cool. Yeah. So just let me know like once we're once we're live. Oh. Uh, Boss, right, man. We're live on YouTube, y'all. Welcome to the Rock and Talk Show. We're live from the Viper Room tonight in Hollywood on Sunset Strip for a special oh, night. Know. But uh, we're live on YouTube, guys. This is the pre-show. The pre-show. Don't forget to like us and spread the word. We got a great show tonight. Some rock and roll history. Some rock and roll history, and maybe a couple surprises. You never know. Couple you never surprises. know. How we is everybody out right there? upstairs playing right now? We got a. We got. We'll talk about them at the beginning of the show. Okay. Cool. What's going on? Mm hmm. So. Sorry. How's it yeah, been we're there? About to start like any minute. Oh, there he good. is. They sound good. They sound amazing. Gary Spivak's here. It's all about. He's the guy that put him on the Jane. Oh boy, you're dropping in and out, brother. Uh, so he's a math. Or so he. Uh, yep, you're all dropping in and out. Here. You're frozen too. He's mm. talking to us or someone else? I think he... I'm talking to you, Dave. Yeah, you and Perk. Oh, really? Yeah, you're... yeah, you've been freezing and then it was dropping. Uh, now, still? Now, well, keep talking. I can't tell. <laughs> well, hi, Captain. Says... Captain America here. Captain America here. I mean, it shows we have a pretty strong signal. So try with this? I don't know. Hopefully it'll. Is it very loud there behind you? That don't might create, create no. feedback though between. Live. We're live. Well, that was, that was old. That's, that's oh, we're delayed. live on YouTube. Oh, you're we're dropping live out. on YouTube. Can you guys hear What's me? What's that? You're dropping in and out. Yes. Uh uh, I guess we're gonna we're gonna go live, y'all. You ready? Yeah, I'm waiting to be let in. If you want to let me in, should I? Yes. Okay, but it might feed turn the back, volume down. So. Yeah. Oh, there's Perk down. In the How does he do that? All right, we're live on Facebook. Oh, that's that's a trip. cool. I'm you guys, on both sides. you guys ready? We're gonna go ahead and start the show. Can Here we go. Me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Sheila. We hear All right, you. here we go, everybody. <laughs> the Rock and Talk Show, Beyond Backstage, with your hosts, Norwood Fisher, Kenny Olson, Scott Page, Stephen Perkins, Sheila Conlon, and David Moss. Hey, and welcome to the Rock and Talk Show. This is show number 47, and we are live from the Viper Room. Perk and I are live from the Viper Room. This is the bi-weekly show that dives deep into the entertainment industry, the business of it, the cultures, the stories, and everything in between. Welcome, Moss Man here. We got the one and only Stephen Perk Perkins right here. Hi, nice it's like he's from you. Chips. We got Norwood Fisher from Fishbone. <laughs> we got, oh, look, we got Stephen <laughs> Perkins right here, too. Look at that. Also nice to meet you. <laughs> we got Kenny Olson, Twisted Brown Trucker Band, Sheila Conlin, the Conlin Company, and last but definitely not least, the one and only Scotty Page, Pink Floyd, <laughs> Super Tramp, Toto. Freaking unbelievable. Hey. How are we all doing? Good. Hey. Fuck, yeah. we had the far side last show. That was amazing. That was yeah, good. Right, far right? side and Chloe Sicorio. Did I say that right? Like I yes, yeah. beautiful. I mean, 
Her song was amazing. Yeah. She was amazed. She was bad. That was her vibe. Awesome. Her vibe was just yeah. like, man, it was soul. Like that was some <clears throat> deep soul. It was, it was honestly not what I expected. And it kind of blew me away in a real positive way. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Two artists it was, it was perfect. You know, and after all that interview that there was so much information with it got looped friction and then she kind of smoothed it off. Yeah, it was cool. Oops. Yeah. And then the yeah, far side. Kind of out. Yeah. I think uh, Norway, really? wow. Norway, why don't you give us a, a your take on last week's show? You know what? It was it was incredible because it was like one. The, what the far side side means to to like LA music and and hip hop in general, like where they where they fit in the hip hop like history, it it means like I I look at them like there's a lot of things that maybe couldn't have been without their being a far side like you know and and and. Chloe came on and killed it like with yeah. such true artistry, like beauty in in what she was doing and how she was bringing it. And you could see yeah. her passion, and yeah. that was inspirational. Yeah, the the part for me that I loved the most was how they were the this is the greatest band to ever do a name change. Uh, it was like it's crazy right that's like the coolest name change i've ever heard it was yeah. how do you get out of that record you know the, you can't like what's well, the far side but here's the far side. i just spelt a little different that was yeah. good i mess i You're messed right. with the game a little bit turned it down so maybe it's not picking up how about now are we we can hear, now? You, uh, can you hear uh, us yeah. yeah we see it. it was just going in and out in and okay. out yeah in and out. it's a good burger Great. but it's bad for microphones Perk, yeah. <laughs> what are we so, doing here at the Viper Room? Like, let's give a little so we're here, update. Yeah, we're here at the Viper Room. My favorite band, Air E. It's spelled A E I R, like Buenos Aires. It's good air. So air is upstairs. <laughs> They're rocking out, and it's great. Gary Spivak is here too, one of our old guests. He's upstairs oh, watching cool. them. Good. So we love Gary. Cool. Yeah. And it's been a long time since I've been on Sunset Boulevard having a good time. It feels good. It does. Yeah, so Gary and I've known each other since like second grade. We wow. grew up together. He grew up in the. He grew up two houses down from Jeff Long, the bass player for Wasted Youth. Wow. And we wow. were all like, you know, we all grew up together. Played ball. Yeah, played Gary, sports. Gary played a big role in us getting a record deal with Atlantic Records back in the day in the nineties too. Oh wow, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah Gary, Gary's the man. Well, so what do we got going on? And speaking of, is that the man? No, oh, there he is. There, there he is. Tommy Black. Yeah. Tommy, Tommy Black. Black. Tommy, come say hi. My face. What do we got? <laughs> What's going on? We got Tommy Black right here. Look Hello. At Tommy so Black. Hello. Hello to the gang. You got Norwood, Kenny, Norwood. Scott, Norwood. and Sheila. No. Nice. Hi, Scott. Hi, Tommy Scott. Black. How's it going? I know I have a fake name for real. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Delton Black. There you ah. go. How you doing? You good? Good. good. How you good. doing? Yeah, we're having a good time. We love uh, Mr. Perkins uh, being in the building always. Yes. Yeah. You guys should come to the building. Yes. Well, maybe we'll do a show. We'll, we'll play. Like, this is fun doing this from here. Maybe yeah. one day we can we can yeah. all come yeah. hang out and do it live from the Viper. Yep. A lot, a lot yeah. of history at the Viper. Yes. Oh, let's, yeah. Let's think X on stage. You that know, would be great. Little, He's up there now. No, that's this right oh, here. Okay, this is that's like, air. That's I'm Stephen awesome. Perkins' band from. That band uh, upstairs is sick. They're good. They're yeah, really they're good. very good. They're very good. It's like you get lucky to see them here first, kind of thing. I guess. Exactly. Right. Oh, nice. Excellent. I don't know. I don't know. I anything. think the last time I was in the Viper Room is when we were showcasing Johnny Cash with his Deaf American recording oh. single. It was amazing. Amazing. Wow. There's no topping that one. <laughs> yeah, no I, I don't think I do. I think I, mean, I, I did a I lot some... of shit and raise hell in the Viper Room. Well, well, That's kind of hard to beat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll bow I down to that. Stories and I can't talk about that one. Yeah, pointing. exactly. Yeah, I have I have too many stories. Some are, yeah, just a lot, <laughs> lot a lot of history of the Viper. <laughs> oh boy. Oh yeah, we've got, we've got some great guests tonight. You know who our guests are? We yeah. got Jimmy DeAnda. You know Jimmy DeAnda, Bullet Boys. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. Jimmy yeah. DeAnda. We got Greg Renoff. He's a historian. He wrote um, 
a book about Van Halen and right. Ted Templeman and who, like who he's, you know, so they're coming on any minute. That's yeah, right. but let's do this. Let's have Scott tell us what's going on with Think X. Because we have some performances this weekend and a few things. Think That's that. right. We've got this Steven week, we're Scott. doing another uh, dome show at the wonderful Wisdom LA, downtown LA. If anybody hasn't seen this, it's crazy. It's in a 360 degree immersive dome. We play, we get lost because it's really cool because the band and the audience are all in it at the same time. So we get yeah. to experience at the same time. It's a fun thing. We do our Think Floyd show. It's uh, We're doing Beyond the Wall. Uh, it's really cool with Perkins and Norwood Perkins and all of us. And uh, just, and he's I, in I town. Saw you guys. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So we're uh, doing that. And then, boy, let's see. We've got whole kinds of things going on. We'll have Think, uh, part of our Think NFT brand is going to be at South by Southwest. And then we got NFT LA coming up where we're going to be playing. That's going to be a crazy cool show coming up in August. And then, gosh, I don't know. What else do we have on the? We've got, we've got, uh, well, the Think NFT show is March 29th, the Wisdom. Right. Yep. And then we have Ocean View Pavilion in Port Wanini, April 23rd. Yep. Yep. And Jacob Law with Jacob Law. With Jacob well. Law, Ooh, right. Cool. So, yeah, a lot of stuff going on. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Bradness. Jacob, no. Yeah, well, that, that's cool. that's cool. Well, nice to meet y'all. Thank nice you. Man. Man. I know y'all. Make like, sure you yeah, fill out your W-2. <laughs> fill out your W-2 on the way out and send it to, to Sheila. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'll make sure you're paid. <laughs> exactly. Do we have a, do we have a yeah. 1099? No, I'm just it was yeah, a surprise, yeah. but a pleasant surprise. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. I don't mind. Like, we cool. made you famous. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> There you go. All right, well, good. Good to see you. Thank you very much. Very well. There it is. Well, who knows who else is going to pop in down here? There's a bunch of rock stars upstairs. It's crazy. It's crazy. Let's get a bunch of rock stars for the Rock and Talk show. We'll see. Right? We'll see what happens. So, who, who's uh? You know what? I'll bring them in. Let's bring them in. Um, I can introduce. We've got Greg Renoff, American we History. Got Jimmy. Greg's not here just yet. But Oh, we got bad Oops. connection. Bad connections. Jimmy's here. <laughs> it's, he I said think Jimmy's he, here. He, I think right? he said, I think they're coming in at about 540, 541. We're getting there. Yep. So we're going to, we can talk about, I can do an introduction and when they're ready, we can bring them in. All right. So All right. Greg Renoff, American history historian and the author of Van Halen Rising. How a Southern California backyard party band saved heavy metal. So super cool. And then he also is the author of Ted Templeman, A Platinum Producer's Life in Music. So pretty cool stuff. He's got some great stories behind the scenes of how he wrote the book. And then we have Jimmy DeAnda, the original drummer for Bullet Boys, touring yep. drummer right now with George Lynch. Mm. And he's one of the most handsome brilliant drummers in town uh and i will vouch for that and point. then we have a special thing perkins is in here right now <laughs> here that, in trouble. i know i know we had a little battle about that because are you sure perkins is going to be okay with that and i'm like absolutely <laughs> um and then we have callie who's a multifaceted artist young young man who's absolutely brilliant he's going to per, uh, perform for us a, a song called daisy and he's also known as California Surfer Boy. So that's going to be a nice treat at the end of the show. Can I tell you how I met him? You can. I was dropping my kid off at school. This very handsome devil came up to me and said, hi, I'm here to greet the kids. And we became friends. He found out I was a drummer. And he said, can I send you a track? And I heard his voice and the tune. I said, how could I help? So that's where we're at now. Right. Awesome. 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 Well, I mean, we've got, I mean, we're, we're, we're we got Jimmy. Why don't we just bring, bring Jimmy in? in? And then when Greg gets here, we'll bring Greg in. Yeah. Yeah. I love Jimmy. Yeah. Gotta bring Jimmy in. What do you think? We can yeah. have a handsome you know, run right. between Perkins and Jimmy. All right. Whoa. Got there, we go. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Hang on. It's oh, hang on. There's <laughs> Jimmy Deanda. Jimmy D. Mm. There the he most, is. the most yeah. handsome, brilliant drummer in town. Well, you know, don't tell, <laughs> don't tell anybody. You'll ruin my reputation. <laughs> Steven. Hi, Jimmy. So me and Jimmy were signed to Warner Brothers by the same lady 
Roberta Peterson. We were signed at the same time. And Roberta Peterson is Ten Templeman's sister. Wow. Yeah. And um, we rehearsed at Lillian Way with Fishbone, Bully Bo Bullet Boys, Guns N' Roses, Jane's Addiction. We all shared one room. Wow. I would, and, I, I, would look at, and, I would look at Jimmy's big arms and say, ooh. And, and, <laughs> and we shared a lot of other things, too. Ooh. Okay, let's, let's, we just brought in Greg, Greg Renoff. We just uh, introduced you, Greg. Welcome to the show. Yay. Hey, thanks. And uh, hey, it was great. I, I heard Stephen, I just heard Stephen talk about Roberta. Yeah, Ted's sister. Um, legendary A&R person. She was uh, very, very, very successful and very good at what she did. And can be very scary. <laughs> <laughs> what makes her scary? Well, she had no qualms in telling people when they weren't doing their job right. Didn't matter what, where you were at in what area of the field. If you were above her, if you were in a different, you know, a whole different setup, she would tell you, you are not doing a good job. And with no uncertain terms, it was really great to watch her work. It was awesome. Oh, that's great. Uh, yes. I appreciate yeah. that in a person. Yeah. Sheila, has a, <laughs> Sheila has a little bit of that, too. I, I certainly do. That's right. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's cool because the rock and roll business in Los Angeles, it's a very small pool to swim in. And it's, it's pretty shallow, too. You don't have to go deep to meet people. <laughs> and, um, you know, I met Jimmy back in the day, and we're still tight and, and documented and talk. So they've Ted and Van Halen changed the world, and it's great to talk about. How how'd you get? Let's talk. Let's dive in. How did you get so connected to be the you know authority on on both of them? Let's start with Van Halen, right? Yeah, because it's an amazing book. It's beautiful. Oh yeah. Um, How's that happen? So yeah. Long story short, I uh, grew up a big fan, and uh, Van Halen ended up going to grad school to become a historian and uh, just kept listening to the same music. You know, everything else changed, but the music stayed the same for me. And uh, I got uh, interested in uh, kind of exploring the band's beginnings. I felt like I knew, like, you know, if you wanted to learn a lot about Van Halen after they got famous, there was a lot of books and there had been um, plenty of information about that, the breakup with Sammy and all that stuff. But uh you know, I, I started to just dig around to, to do a little bit of writing for fun on, uh, I was going to write a little article for Van Halen News Desk on, I don't know, something about their, the, the band's beginnings. I had heard that there were, um, there were these backyard parties and I ended up actually connecting with some people on Facebook who were from Pasadena and they started telling me these stories and that just all kind of started. And I was like, really? And like, you know, doing to Wikipedia was like two sentences about they play parties and played clubs. And then they got signed by Ted Templeman and they, you know, got famous. And I was like, wow. And yeah, you, know, you need to talk to this person. This person had a party in their backyard in San Marino. Oh, mm -hmm. you need to talk to this person. You know, Van Halen played in their living room, you know? And so <laughs> that's really where it started. And then uh, out of doing the Van Halen rising book, I did, uh, got to know Ted who, uh, had produced obviously the first six Van Halen records and had a very successful career as an A&R guy. And then as a in-house producer for Warner brothers, and then as a executive vice president. And, uh, after that book, my Van Halen book was finished. I kind of pitched him on the idea of doing a Van Halen book, actually be a, a, a biography after doing the Van Halen book. And he's like, of me, <laughs> it was like me. And I was like, yeah, I think, yeah, it'd be kind of interesting. You know, he had been a pop star and there's a lot of stuff to talk about with that. And he's like, who'd want to read a book about me? I don't think, you know, you know, Jimmy, like, I don't want to do the invitation, but Jimmy will know it. It's just very like, you know, I don't know. It's just, I don't think anyone will want to read a book about me. And it's like, well, let's see. And then I just started working on it and uh, I got a book deal for it. And I think he was actually a little bit surprised because I think he was being kind to being like, well, if this kid really wants to kind of work on this thing about me, I'm not going to stop him and I'm flattered and, you know, go have to go, you know, he'll, he'll get bored. And I never really got bored of it. So next thing, you know, you know, we, we uh, worked on it for over a couple of years, really, really intensely. I talked to him almost every day and by email or by phone call. And, you know, he really was um, enthused about it when most enthused about it, really, like when we first talked about it. And I kind of sold him on the idea when I said, look, it's going to be about the artist. I really think that's what it should be about. It's not about your personal life drama. It's not about this and that. It's not. It's about that 
what he would tell me and be most excited about that he got to work with Michael McDonald and he got to work with Eddie Van Halen and Sammy Hagar and, you know, Carly Simon, you go to the list of all the incredible stars he worked with. And he, he, he felt so, um, for lack of a better term, so honored that he got to be collaborate with these level of people. Um, and, and Jimmy will understand this too, that Ted will tell you himself that he was never a very, you know, he was a pop star, but he was like, a, he was not, a, you know, he didn't feel comfortable in that role and really felt like, that was not for him. And he was never anywhere near the level of talent, musical talent, the people he worked with. And so he always said, like, if I could help people, you know, be better to shine on a record, that was what made me most happy because I was never very, you know, very good at it, basically. I, you know, I had, I had some musical talent, obviously he's a talented musician, but he's like, I never had the, the ability to sing. Like, you know, he would always, he'd always joke, um, uh, you know, I, I don't have to mention the artist names, but he would talk about certain people who wanted to like musicians, super, super talented musicians who wanted to produce. And he'd be like, if I could play guitar like that, or I could sing like that, I, you know, I, I you know, I would never want to be on this side of the glass. You know, he'd be like, you know, he's like, if I could do that, I'd be over there, you know, and, and then someone else would be sitting by the board going, take three, Ted, you're, you're great. You know, he said, you know, it's going to be a number one. So he was, um, you know, he was, he had a very, uh, I think. It's definitely, um, definitely a legend. I yeah. Mean, I admire, he admired those through, kind of stuff. Through little feet. He did, yeah. he did a yeah. couple records with Little Feet when they were with Warner Brothers. I, I remember when James made a record, and I heard Bullet Boys did Ten Templeman's production. I was so interested to hear how it went and what it's like to work with a producer like that. Because when we did our record, Dave Jordan was an engineer for Brian Eno. He didn't produce yet. His first production was us. Wow. Cool. So he, he, you know, Brian Eno's engineer, we thought that'd be fine. It worked out. But I always wanted to find out what it was like. So, Jimmy, when you get in there, did he have you, did he watch rehearsals? What, how well, he, you... what, what's funny is that when we got signed, we got signed. This, this is one of my favorite memories. I have, I have several with Ted, but, and we used to, uh, we nicknamed him Tedward because of the Edward uh, connection. He was Tedward to us. But um, he came down to uh, uh, the place we actually showcased for Roberta Peterson was in a place called, we dubbed the Piss Room because it was uh, alongside of these train tracks and there was a lot of uh, uh, homeless people that lived on, on kind of on the outskirts there. And they used to piss against the wall. So where our rehearsal room was, the outer wall was just literally 20, 30 people a day pissing and shitting right there. And <laughs> And lo and behold, the, the, the day that Roberta Peterson comes to see us, she goes, and it's so funny because it's so perfect when I think about this, because she came and saw us and she, she was, like I said, you guys, she had no bones. She goes, well, you're not really my cup of tea because then she had signed Jane's and, and, and Flaming Lips and so on and so on. So she was a little bit more left of the curb. And she goes, but my brother will like you. And I remember thinking, well, fuck, I, I, I'm glad your brother likes us, but what the fuck does that mean exactly? And then so, so. Actually, <laughs> Ted Templeman pulls up to the piss shit room in a fucking Rolls Royce. I swear wow. to God, pulls up and comes out and he, he's te he watches us play and he does his thing. For those of us who are, you know, and most of us are musicians, we've done the fucking the, the showcasing process and some guys don't have the time. So Ted does this. He goes, you guys, when I've heard enough of a song, I'll raise my hand. So we're like, OK, so we're fucking I'm rocking my fucking life out. I'm, this is it. This is the moment I've been waiting for. You know, and I'm fucking spitting sticks. I'm fucking throwing up on myself. And Ted just slowly goes, and so, oh, okay, oh, we stop. And we go, next song? And he goes, next song? And then there he goes. Let me get to the next chorus. Okay. So, and it was so weird because I thought like, oh, we're fucking sucking it right now. This is a lame experience. I can't believe this is, we're blowing it. And then we go down to, he goes, well, come down off the drum. Of course, I had to have a drum riser in a rehearsal room because I'm a fucking egomaniac. I have a drum <laughs> riser in there. And he says, come down off the drum riser. I'm going to talk to you guys. And we're like, okay. And then he begins to tell us why he believes Bullet Boys should be uh, on Warner Brothers Records. And he, and he starts talking like, like, I'm like, are you kidding me? Sign the contract. Let's go, man. Let's go, you know? <laughs> and he was just, he, but he was so great about a couple of things. And I talked to Greg because I was a part, blessed enough to be a part of that book for Templeman. But Teddy was great. There was a couple of things he was great at. And one of the things that he was amazing at is letting you be you and finding how to get you to come up to the surface. You know, because when I first did the first record, I was 19 years old and I was scared shitless. I'm a huge Van Halen fan. I saw Ted Templeman name on the back of every fucking Van Halen record. So now I'm doing my job and behind that fucking glass window, like he said, is Ted Templeman. 
you know? And, and every now and again, I'm like, holy shit, this is fucking serious. And then at one point, I kept, I didn't know this, but I kept making a mistake. And then, and then he kept like, and those of us again have been in the studio, when that glass, when you can't hear them, you can't hear them talking back there. So, you know, you guys stop playing. And he goes, hold on. It's like God's talking in your fucking cans because it shuts down every sound. And you hear, hold on. And you're like, oh, shit. And you stop playing. And he's just, all you see is the mouths moving. <laughs> and I'm like, is that me? Are they talking about me? Is it me? I'm fucking up. All right. Oh, shit. So at one point, Ted actually stopped the whole session and says to the rest of the band, hey, uh, bass player, guitar player, singer, why don't you guys take 10? And I'm like, oh, fuck, he's going to replace me with a studio drummer. I'm like, I feel like I'm going to throw up. I'm like, fuck. And the guy actually came out. Keep in mind, I'm 19 years old. I'm born and raised in Boyle Heights. You know, I wasn't supposed to go this far. So in my head, I'm like, it's over. He comes out, pulls up a little chair by the piano next to me. And, and a guy comes in with a 12 pack, or a six pack of Heineken beer and sits down. And then he hands me a beer. And I'm looking at him. And he goes, so Jimmy, he goes, where are you from? And he's, we start shooting the shit. And then we, you know, and then, and then at one point we finished the beers and he goes, okay. He goes, you ready to do this? And I go, yeah. So we did the song. It was the first song on the record. And it's the one that's on the record right now that you hear. Years later, I asked him about that story. I go, so Ted, what was that about? And he goes, Jimmy, he goes, you were so nervous. You, you kept looking at me like, like you were freaked out. He goes, I went in there to, to uh. just eat, just ease it out, baby. And he brought me down. He cooled me out. And then. I was able to do the record. Now he did, he took the time to do that for a wow. kid that he could have easily replaced me with fucking Kenny Aronoff or fucking Stephen Perkins, no problem. <laughs> but he said, I'm gonna go out there and talk to this kid. So again, Templeman for me is one of the absolute top experiences of my life in the music industry. And again, cool. thank you for having me a part of that, Greg. I was really grateful for that. Yeah, well, it's great. I mean, yeah, definitely. I mean, that's that's uh, the other story, which I'd love for you to tell. Is, uh, that's a great story, Jimmy. Yeah. That wow. is an amazing yeah. story. Wow. Yeah. You know, I, I heard Kenny Aronoff, when he shows up at the gigs now, there was a session, he'll flip the engineer 50 bucks. So when they start talking about him behind the, the, the glass, the engineer will unmute the mute mic. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny hears every word. And before they say anything, Kenny's like, let me try it again with less hi-hat. They're like, that's what we were thinking. You're this brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. That is, that, that's fucking brilliant. I know. Oh, wait, I have to tell a quick little story because Moss and I went to see the Allman Brothers the other night. And all of a sudden, I see Aronoff behind one of the drum sets. And I oh, look yeah. at David and I go, that's Kenny Aronoff. He goes, yeah. And I go, well, I didn't know. So I texted Kenny. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm here at the show. This is so great. You're such a rock star. And he texts me back. He goes, yeah, I am here. I'm playing. And guess what? I am a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> I no, love Aaron. Oh he's the greatest. Yeah. Look, guys, look, look who's here. Man. Look who's Smoke here. Him if you got him. Look who's here. Oh, oh Spivak, the one and only Gary. Hey, Gary. Up, brother? Say hello to the crew here. Hello, crew. Uh, Gary, you're an author in the house too. Gary was upstairs checking <laughs> out air. So give us a give us a review. What do you, what do you think? think? It was rock and roll, and and when I and I want to stress the and roll, which is like a missing thing in rock and roll these days. There's so much. Eh. And the, that kind of swagger is missing. I was going to say they're yeah. very raw. They feel very raw. Like they early feel... Aerosmith. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. They're they they're old school, too. old soul school. Too, yeah. And they've got soul. Yeah. yeah, they got a vibe. So, so I think this is really important. <laughs> really important that we have Greg here because you know what you did with the book for Van Halen and the early beginnings. I mean, I think it's amazing. I think every band should have an author like you to be able to tell the story because it, I mean, it's so exciting what you did. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that. I think for me, that was the, the drive to try to do the book that there was all of this, these years of um, struggle. And I think a lot of bands have that where they're out there, you know, playing clubs and, and that was the, you know, that was the thing at the, in the era that was a lot of them had that history. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was obviously, a, a, you know, it was never, not fun to write. I mean, you know, I would just talk to these people and, you know, for, it was interesting when I would talk to the, the locals and most of the, 
uh, the most like a good portion of the interviews were just like regular people who were like you know like tradesmen now or they like oh, you know they're realtors or something and they talked about that era as like being the some of the most fun times of their whole life that they would you know sort of like looking back on yeah we won the high school state championship that year or something like that you know it's like yeah we got to go see van halen play in the backyards or i paid david lee roth and eddie van halen 75 dollars and they played my birthday party in my living room you know and van halen did so that was a you know, that was a real fun um aspect of it but the other thing that was interesting and, and uh really compelling was the the personality stuff which even back then people you know were seeing that the brothers were so different from dave and especially when they linked up with dave this is the kind of the oldest story in the music biz is that you know the the, the lead singer <laughs> lead singer disease or whatever that you want to call it is that you know that the brothers were uh, they just you know they thought dave was a little bit like left of center, as, as Jimmy just said, they didn't, they definitely didn't think like, you know, he was not from their tribe, so to speak. And when they got together, there was a, you know, there was sort of had to be sort of a meeting of the minds to kind of make it work. But that was what made, you know, obviously made, we all know made Van Halen tick, but that was fun too. even talking to, to, to guys who grew up with the Van Halen's going on. And when they, you know, one guy told me, he goes, when, uh, when Dave joined what was called Mammoth became Van Halen, we all thought he, he, they ruined the band and the guy told me i went up to eddie after one of their early gigs and he goes when are you when are you getting rid of this guy and eddie said what are you talking about we need this guy i i we need this guy you uh -huh. know you know basically even like then kind of like understanding that this was whatever issues there were whatever it didn't how it didn't seem to work at first that, that there was a recognition that there was something there that the brothers saw it dave said there was something there that was going to be um worth sticking with it did, did you, did you I interview? Always, oh go ahead I was say i was I always thought there should have been a sequel to Fast Times at Ridgemont uh, High because you talk about the parties when Spicoli saved Brooke Shield from drowning and <laughs> play the party. That should have been the sequel, you That's know, great. of that. Yeah, whole I, I mean, the era, too, that they grew up in, it's interesting. It's really much like very, very dates, like that 74, 75 days to confuse movie era like that, that they had yeah. the same music, the ZZ Top, the same. It's the same. I always watch that movie and think, yeah, this could have been set in Los Angeles, the same type of thing. Yeah. Scott, Look, what do you Luke, have to say? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, so you must have interviewed Lukather, right, with this for this thing. I, I didn't interview Lukather, you know, because the, the book itself really ends in 78. And uh, so Lukather didn't really get to know um, Ed until later, I don't think, 78, right, 79, right. when Ed sort of got on the scene. So the book, you know, the book wrapped with um, with the end of the 78 tour with them kind of coming home and having gone from nobody out of out of Los Angeles, outside of Los Angeles, knew who Van Halen was. And of course, they're playing Anaheim Stadium and they're, you know, playing with Sabbath and they become international renowned bands. So that's the sort of, that, that's the book where the book closes. But yeah, I mean, Lukather and Ed have been, you know, they were tight for, for yeah, you could do a book. Just, the stories just between the two of them, you could do a whole book on. Just oh, yeah. yeah. I, uh, yeah. one of the real quickly, I'll tell you a, a, a story that, uh, Don Landy, who was, um, the engineer who worked with Templeman with all the Van Halen records and went, went on and worked with Ed after 5150 for years talked about that. Uh, he told me that when, uh, they did the first, iteration of jump before the album came out they had finished it basically and it wasn't you know but it hadn't been fully mixed or everything lukather came up to visit ed at 5150s this was in the summer of 83 and they played jump for lukather and don landy told me that lukather was like oh that's kind of different wow and he's like yeah he's like oh wow and, and ed's like we're gonna put that on the album and he's like you know like he was like you know kind of like deer in the headlights for a second like was just sort of taken aback by how different it was but that you know that was even lukather's reaction was like well that's a, like you know that's a little bit going to be a little different or whatever but yeah i know that lukather was around like obviously all those all those years yeah. it was very close with that yeah when i played with toto jimmy he, uh, eddie used to come around all the time because we had rehearsals and stuff cool and there were a few times when you know eddie and luke can hang pretty heavy <laughs> i bet i bet i mean i love to hear those two guys jam i mean that's like the yeah it was great i want to i want to shift back to jimmy real quick jimmy yeah you just got off a rock and roll cruise I did. Oh, yeah. And I was, I couldn't believe the lineup. I mean, Deep Purple, Sticks. Yeah. I mean, tell, tell us about the, it. Because you got home safe, thank you, and you're home. Right. Who, were you, who were you out with, first of all? So I was out, I'm out uh, playing with George Lynch right now from Doc and Fame. And um, he's such a good was, guitar player. You know, he, he's one of those guys, like, it's just wired differently up there. You know, a, a lot of you guys out that I'm looking at right now, you guys are similar in that process, the way you look at an instrument and then you move forward on it. It's, 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 it's very, it's a beautiful thing. But um, so we're out on this cruise, like, like Stephen said, Deep Purple Sticks, Don Felder, um, Pat Travers was there, who oddly what? enough has not aged a day. It's fucking Little Feet, don't devil. forget Little Feet, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. He's, Little Pete was on that. I mean, it was, you know, and I'll tell you what's amazing. And, and it's so true that, you know, a lot of our heroes are leaving us. And, and it's important to get out there and see these bands and, and go and have these experiences, you know, because, you know, for me, I mean, we all grew up in, the, I, I believe, the greatest time period of music, you know, the 70s, the 60s and the 70s and 70s funk, the 70s rock was to me, the reason that the 80s had any bit of hope was the bands that came out of that period. You know, they really kind of touched on bands. And 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 I think that, thank God, again, you know, we're, we're getting to see like, the, you know, the, the remnants of Deep Purple. It's only, you know, three guys original, but still it's great to hear the music from the guys who wrote it, you know, and, and it was it was a great experience. It was a much older crowd that I'm used to. You know, uh, I, I jokingly said something about taking out my junk and doing something. And they literally looked at me like, get the fuck away, dude. I was like, oh, no, no I'm just joking. <laughs> just drummers, we just what we do. <laughs> and so are you are you doing more shows with Lynch here on, yeah. on shore on the on the mainland? <laughs> yeah, well, actually, we have a couple of L.A. shows coming up in the summer, but I have a whole string of dates coming up. And, and oddly enough, George is reuniting with the singer from Dawkins. So. George is opening the show for Dawkin, and then we're, we're out opening for Dawkin. And then at the end of the night, the two get together and they they play a little bit and have some fun and reminisce about the old days. So again, seeing these guys, you know, remember those guys were around. They, remember, here's a little, I don't know if, if uh, Greg, you know this, you, I'm sure you do, but Ted Templeman went to go sign George Lynch's band the day that he saw Van Halen accidentally and then said, oh, fuck that, I'm signing this. <laughs> Wow. That's, oh. that's true. George told me that. Wow. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. The same thing happened with the Stooges and MC5. I think Epic went to see MC5 and signed the Stooges. And like three months later, they gathered up with Wayne. But there it is. Yeah. There it is. You know, yeah, that's crazy. Right. So, hey, G hey, Jimmy. Yeah. Jimmy. So, you, okay, you were 19 making your first record, right? Yeah. What was what 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 was the what was the first band that you played in and it was that like and, and how old were you when you when you played in your when you started? Well, I was 13 years old when me and my brother started, and it was me and my brother and a lot like Van Halen. Again, I hate to keep going back to this, but that's the connection I have so much with Van Halen. But it's just like you, uh, you and Fish, you know. There, yeah. There's a there's a a thing, and if you're lucky enough to be able to be in a band with your brother or a sibling when you're a kid, you will fucking learn shit that you've never learned in a way. Mm -hmm. And you could kind of always go to that library. You could pull stuff out. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember uh, me and my brother learning, like trying to learn Yes records, you know, Tempest wow. Fugit. I mean, it was like, you know, we were shooting way beyond the stars, but yeah. you know, we got a little close and it was okay. You know, but uh, yeah. so I was in a band. I was, I was just, you know, I really didn't do much. I'll be honest with you, you know what? I just did a, I did a few local things. And then I was 18 and the singer from Bullet Boys, who I knew from when we were kids, the singer Mark. And then he came back when I was 18 and said, dude, you're ready. You're a great drummer. We, I need to get you on the road. And I was like, oh, you know, I, I took it with a grain of salt. You know, he, LA, everybody's full of shit in LA. Everybody says something, it's not true. And then there I was getting a call to come and audition for Bullet Boys and they were managed by Dave Kaplan mm -hmm. who uh, now Dave Kaplan manages Brian Setzer, Stray Cats, Eric Clapton, Dave uh, uh, for the Rhythmics. I mean, down the line has a label of his own. So he, he actually, and this is, a, this is funny, this shows you how young I was, okay? I didn't want to join the band. It was 87. I had my own thing. It was kind of like a Rage Against the Machine in 87, okay? I had yeah. this in 87. So uh, uh, I, I wanted a guy that rap. I was in a run DMC and I was at that Santa Monica Civic show. Uh, All right. <laughs> yeah, that, that show with run. You guys are running, but you guys played run DMC a couple of times where there was shootings. And I remember that was some scary shit. And, we, and I don't know. I don't want to I want to bring that up right now, but I, mean, <laughs> I missed out on the, it's likely I didn't know about the shootings at run DMC shows. Yeah. But the, the Santa Monica Civic with public enemy. Yeah, that one. Yeah. That was gnarly day. <laughs> that was a real deal. But was uh, Fishbone so, playing on that? Yeah, yeah. Fishbone, playing Public with Public Enemy, Enemy? Fishbone, Public Enemy, Living Color, and Stetson Sonic. Stetson Sonic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh. yeah. But but I end up uh, uh, so I, I really don't want to join the band. And the manager says he turns to me. I'm I'm, I'm 18 years old, and he goes, Jimmy. He goes, what would it take for you to join this band? I said, I, I really don't know, Dave. And he goes, how would, how would you like free drums and free cymbals? I'm in. <laughs> and that was it. But, here's, but wait, no, no. Here, here's, the, here's the kicker. Wait, wait, Jimmy, here's the Jimmy, kick Jimmy, Jimmy. Hold on, wait, no, hold on. Hold on. Here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. Years later, he goes, Jimmy, he goes, 
I would have given you 50% of publishing if, if you wanted it. I was like, oh, it's good. <laughs> Ouch. I was going to oh, well, say, 19. I didn't think you, you were that easy. You <laughs> didn't tell me that. <laughs> yeah, I was that easy, man. Yeah. Uh, Gary's but, feedback is saying goodbye, everybody. Love bye, everybody. Gary. Love Gary. Anything? Gary. 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 Anything? Uh, Aftershockfestival.com. We, we announced it with um, Foo Fighters, Kiss, My Chemical Romance, Slipknot. Nice. Uh, Jane's yeah. Addiction. It's all good. I got I got nothing but rock and roll love. Good thanks, seeing you. Thanks for having me, everybody. Good seeing thanks you. Gary. Wait, wait, there you go. Get a proper goodbye. Say a proper where you can <laughs> see you. There you go. Bye. 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 <laughs> oh my God. So this is so crazy. I mean, like like yeah. Greg <laughs> and Jimmy and I were talking, you know, during our pre-interviews and everything. And it's so the one thing that both of you brought up that I think is really important is the hustle and the determination and what you guys went through back then. And so and like everyone on the screen, it basically went through that. Right. And it's so different today. Oh. I'm not saying that the, the new artists today are hustling and a struggle, but you know, Greg and Jimmy, if you guys want to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the stuff that you mentioned in the book about the clubs they pay, played, the biker bars, the, you know, what, what, what you would do just to get out there and play. Yeah, I'll let Jimmy, let Jimmy talk. I mean, Jimmy, you guys played the strip yeah, quite yeah, a bit before. And I'll, I'll tell you, you know, and again, when we talked uh, the other day, you know, I'd mentioned that that, that was one of the things that I, I remember holding true to my, uh, to my upbringing was what I, uh, what I was taught. So you want a new symbol, you go cut grass and then you, you, you make the money to get the symbol. You know, if you, your band wanted to go in the studio, you held a car wash and you guys did a car wash. I mean, you know, not, nobody had a job. We had to do whatever the fuck it was to make shit happen. And I'm not saying that the kids today don't do that, but I do know that what's well, unfortunate because there's no real industry to really kind of go after anymore. So that in itself is, right. is difficult, but when we were kids, I remember there was nothing that was going to stop because we had a goal. We wanted to play because we, we were talking earlier about great clubs that are no longer around. But and I lived two block or five blocks from the country club. That was a goal of mine. When I was 15 years old, I wanted to play the country club because I saw Metallica and Armored Saint and Malice at the country club. So I want to play the fucking country club. So that was a part of a goal. And I feel like, unfortunately, today people wait for the phone to ring. Right. We didn't wait for the phone to ring. We called guys. I used to call bands up and go, hey, dude, you got the wrong drummer. What does that mean, Jimmy? I'm your <laughs> drummer, dude. Kick your drummer out. I'm the fucking guy, bro. Get me in the band. That you know? guy's and got my... <laughs> He's got my... Well, you already took it away. Job. My job. <laughs> yeah, you know what? You... James did a show with uh, at the country club. I went, I went home that night. I said, I'm, I made it. We played in front of 800 people. <laughs> yes. Dude, yeah. Anytime you got to play the country club, that was a big deal back in the day, right? Right, Scott? It was like so thrilling, right? Uh, I, oh, I love that. Yeah. And, and what I what I knew in my own little thing was that's where they recorded Boom Boom, I'll Go the Lights was at the country club. Yeah. yeah. So that's what, yeah. So I was like, you know, I, I'm like, like Steven said, I'm successful. I played there. You know, and, and again, I just love the hustle because I remember seeing Fishbone. I remember seeing Jane's early on. And these guys were out there fucking, it, nothing was phoned in, okay? There was not a performance phoned in. Every performance you saw of both of those bands literally were, were life-changing experiences for me. It was like, what the fuck? This doesn't even, see, these are like, like caricatures that came to life. That's yeah. what those bands were for me, but with great talent. And that's so that taught us all. You want to be that and you got to practice your fucking ass off and you got to get the shows and go out there and never phone it in because you don't know who's in the audience seeing you. But you know, it's so, so I, interesting I, too, when you think about it, because of the, we had no cell phones, we had no computers. No. So the thought of going to a show, yep. it didn't matter what it was, man. It was just yep. the, 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 the get together, go get your buddies, go hang, go see a killer show. Oh yeah. yeah those were great days. You know what, what, what really, what, what we had that focused the scenes, was was magazines and 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 mm. fanzines that's right right yeah green baby like, green. like it was bam. picking up bam 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 <clears throat> la weekly yeah you know 
Scratch the calendar, magazine, the calendar the section, Sunday calendar, the Sunday calendar, That's right. Sunday calendar. In the LA Times was my Bible. Was, yeah, so you 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 look you everybody looked toward the same few, like uh uh what was the the L A Rock uh oh, Ruben uh, Blues magazine? Yeah, because uh, I, I remember no. Ruben Blue had a fanzine called Ruben Scratch Blue had his, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, and then it grew up. Yeah, Green and blue. That's right. Yeah. Well, you know, the one thing that we kept from the old days was we used to get 50 bucks for a club kid then, and we still get 50 bucks for a club kid. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like perfect. So we yeah. passed along. <laughs> it hasn't changed that much. That's right. It hasn't, it hasn't changed, changed that much. <laughs> right, right, right. So, Greg, what do you think that, you know, from doing, I mean, that had to be just an amazing experience. I know that you were a fan of Van Halen when you were a kid. That's why you had this passion and it touched so many parts of your life when you listen to them. But, you know, kind of speak to the other future writers or authors out there. Like, what gave you the guts and what gave you that, you know, that thing just to jump into doing this? Because that that was pretty cool. Well. Um... I think for me, the thing that I had going for me was that, uh, you know, I had written a book before since I um, and had been trained as a historian. So I actually, you know, had I, I did think once I started to get my hands around this thing that there I could I could actually tie all this thing together. But what I didn't have going for me was that, you know, I didn't have, um, you know, I, I didn't have the rock and roll cred as an author. I was I was like a college professor. I mean, literally, that's what I, you know, at that time. Um, I've left academia, kind of moved on, but that was what I did. So it's like on paper, it's like, you know, this guy who's like teaching history to, you know, college students on a Thursday morning is going to write this book about this great rock and roll band. So I think that was the thing that was sort of like, you know, was kind of uh, working against me in some ways. People are like, I don't know. I don't know if you're the right, if you're the guy, basically. Um, but, you know, I, I, um, I became obsessed with it. I mean, I think that's what I probably all can agree with, whether it's, you know, an instrument or like a drive to make your band make it. I just became obsessed with it. And after a while, it didn't really, to me, it didn't really matter um, whether a hundred people read the book or a thousand people read the book or my mom bought 10 copies. And then she was the, you know, she had the most copies in the world or something. It didn't, it didn't matter because I thought the story needed to be told and I was just obsessed with it. I mean, I became absolutely obsessed with trying to get this, um, this all tied together. I mean, even all the things that were all sort of shrouded in mystery and Jimmy will appreciate this. The whole, whole there was a whole uh, era in time with Van Halen where Gene Simmons had yeah. basically signed them to a management deal in late 1976. And this was all sort of very fuzzy and how it was written up in Wikipedia and people didn't really know when this, this all happened. And I talked to people like um, Jackie Fox, who was in the runaways and, you know, she was telling me, she's like, Oh yeah, I used to go see, you know, go see Gene and Paul over at the, uh, you know, over at um, the, the Sunset Marquee, we used to sit by the pool and, and drink wow. vodka gimlets. And I, <laughs> she's like, yeah, we were like 17 and we're just sit with them and drink and talk to them. And then Gene started asking me like, what bands do, what bands do you like? We want to form a record label. And they're like telling like Lita and Jackie, you know, and that stuff really just got me like super, like, I was like, wow, nobody really, like people know this stuff sort of like, you know, obviously it's not like Jackie never said it before, but no, people don't really know how all this stuff kind of came to pass and all of the, um, just the, the, advent, the the journey that those guys went on uh, to make it. So the, when I started hearing those types of stories, it just gave me more and more fuel to kind of finish it out to the end and and uh, tell that what I thought was a great untold rock story. Well, that, you know, you sort of have a similar trajectory like everybody else here is like, you had a passion, you knew what you wanted and you went out and got it and you did whatever it took to make it happen. Yeah. So that's, that's really kind of cool, right? You're the writer. Jimmy's a drummer, Steven's a drummer, Scott's a sax player, Norwood's a bass player, Kenny a guitar player. You're the writer. So you went out, went out and got it, just like all these guys went and got, went out and got what they wanted. Well, and it's, you know, for me, I just, I, you know, it's, it's, a pretty, it's a great pinch me moment for you guys tonight. I mean, about, you know, all the records, all the people all around me, I'm like, you know, bought your records, listen to your CDs obsessively and like the albums. So it's a very cool thing for me. And I'm just, uh, you know, it's, it's very satisfying because I'm just enjoyed the people, enjoyed what I, put so much energy into it. And I'm sure you guys can relate. It's a song you write or an album you play sure. on our show you play. People come up and say, I love that. That was so amazing. That feels great. You know, well, what? we're grateful to have you on the show and grateful for what, all that you're doing too. Oh, thanks, man. Awesome. Hey, hey, I was Greg, lucky, can't wait for my book to be finished. Where are you done yet? <laughs> no. Yeah. I was lucky enough to meet uh, Jim Ladd once and oh, yeah. actually met him twice, but I only remember once. 
<laughs> yeah. But um, I told him, you know, his voice is just as important as Robert oh, Plant's yeah. or Jim Morrison's. And same with the words of a writer. These words are just as important as the lyrics because it uh, weaves you into the story. Yeah. It's romantic. I, I use the word romance because it's not about love. It's about turning yourself on. And, and your book turns people on and music does. And, and I kind of want to, you know, figure out how to use that information that all of us have gathered, especially Scott. You've been in like bands, Seals and Crop. <laughs> I mean, you know, this guy has seen it all to be able to give this information to young musicians. And that's why we have this new part of the show where we're doing new artists. It doesn't matter how old or young you are, if you have some music, help push it out there. Yeah. And, you know, learning from you and what you've yeah. discovered and everybody here. Um, I met this cat, Callie at my school, my son's school, and he's got a beautiful voice. So I said, how could I help? Because that's what it's about. It's about taking anything we've learned. How many bridges have we drawn? Now right. it's time to help people cross that bridge. Absolutely. And, and that's why there he is. Hey, Callie. Oh, how are you doing there? <laughs> Welcome to the Rock and Talk Show. Perfect timing. Perfect Turn that up here. <laughs> how you feeling? How you feeling well, let's, let's give him a proper introduction. That was well. Well, that was a good he's one. Got, okay. <laughs> you know, he's, he's a poet, he's a thinker, he's got a huge soul. California surf, surfer boy. I like to call him Cal. I thought you were going to yeah. say a midnight toker. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's me. That's me. How are, how are you, my man? I'm good. How are you guys? Nice you. What's up, brother? Where, where are you, Cali? Where? What part of the world are you in right now? I'm in uh, Hollywood, California. Oh, look at that. We are yeah. too. That's right. Yeah. Down the street. And so how, how long have you been writing songs with the ukulele? Um, probably it's the past three years, three, four years. Yeah. And what made you choose the uke? Um, I was, I was trying to get into music and I always wanted to play the piano, but I struggled with learning two hands. So I was like, what's, I wanted to, I was at the point in my life, like I want to write songs for me to sing them and I want to accompany it with an instrument. And I looked up like the easiest instrument to learn, and what you could call next. <laughs> is there cool. such a thing as an easy instrument to learn? Really? Yeah. No, that's interesting. To do, it, to do it well, right? Yeah. It wasn't Tiny Tim. It wasn't. Tiny Tim. <laughs> you know what's cool? It's because what instrument you choose really depends on where the music's going to go. And I, I was talking about this two weeks ago or a month ago on the show that I'm a fan of Neil Diamond, but when he writes on the piano, I'm not a big fan of those tunes because they seem a little too sappy but when he writes with a guitar he grabs me so the ukulele brings something to you now this first tune you played me six months ago daisy can you tell us how it came about yeah um i actually i was i work i work at a school and i'm a supervisor there mostly but what our job is is to basically just tell the kids to go to class when they're at recess or lunch and so a lot of the day is spent doing nothing so I bring my ukulele every day and just to fill up time and you know work on some stuff, write some songs. And I was playing a, a certain progression that I came up with that day and I had no lyrics or anything. And, and then this group of like eighth graders that I just met like kind of crowded around me and told me to play it louder. And I was like, oh, okay, fine, you know, I'll, I'll play it. Um, and then, you know, eighth graders are mean. And I started playing it and they liked it. And then one, this one girl, um, she was like, you know what, you should call it Daisy. And I was like, like she walked away back to her class, but I was like, you know what, I will call this Daisy. And that's how it came to be. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, cool. That's Did great. You, you know, percent everybody... of the writing? No, just kidding. What did you uh, say? Exactly. <laughs> but, I, but inspiration comes from what's around you. Like as a drummer, I hear a woodpecker or a mm -hmm. VW bug, bub -da -bub -da -bub -da, get turned on, you know, simple yeah. words. Bob Dylan said it. He hears somebody say a word, and it's all of a sudden in his next lyric because he mm. got he heard someone saying something like no, so. No. No. Charles Connor. That's Little, an organic music. No, no. Charles Connor, Little Richard's first oh. drummer, told me yeah. that that they were walking. He was in it. They were in Louis in 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 New, New Orleans, going to the train station to go to back to Mobile. I mean to uh to Georgia. And the train went by and he and he said, Little Richard asked me what 
is is you hear the rhythm that the train is making and Charles Connor said yes and Little Richard said that's the rhythm of the music that we're going to make and that became Little Richard's rhythms for his version of rock and roll yeah. wow wow that's cool I didn't know that Sorry. Holly what that's school perfect. what school do you work at where where are you in a middle school it's a middle school high school it's called Lila Los Angeles International, like Lise International School. It's a French international school. Lise, oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, know. I know Lise, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I know it very well myself. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you yes, do. Yes, you do. Yes, you so, do. Are you, are you ready to explore the space and give us your song? I think I'm ready, yeah. If you guys okay. Okay, so so we're all going to so, yeah, so don't be nervous. We're all going to critique you afterwards. Let, let, <laughs> let's, don't let, be nervous. Let's, <laughs> let's everyone mute. Okay. And uh, Callie, the stage is yours. All right. You guys hear me okay? Yeah, yep. you sound great. All right. Here's Daisy. Say that she was my favorite noise. I like that. Yeah. that was, how old are you, Callie? How old are you? Just out of curiosity. I'm 30. 30. Yeah. You, look, you look young, dude. You are young. Thanks, man. You look really young. <laughs> We're all young here. Yeah. I love your voice, and I'm so happy I met you. And um, you know, I see you every day at school with a smile. But it's great to see you making music. And any way I can help, you know, I'm gonna keep trying to introduce you to the world because you are a, a, a real special guy thanks man appreciate it thanks yeah, thank yeah. You. so let's ask you what what do you have coming up Callie um coming up I have I'm working on a five track EP right now and hoping to release it I don't know and then within the next month and just 
just keeping on writing songs um, on the music end. And then me and my brother are actually filmmakers as, as well. And I have a movie premiere, uh, premiering next month. Wow, what kind of movie? Yeah, what's that called? It's called Six Crowd, and it's a fake documentary about a uh, all-female British pop group, all of the Spice Girls, and we shot it in a way that makes it seem like it's the year 1996, and we kind of want the audience, like, I don't know if you guys have seen the Blair Witch Project, but yeah. 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 It's, all, it's, yeah, it's not a horror movie, but in the same vein of, like, we want people to watch this and be like, this is real. I love these girls. They had it. They had it all. Why did it? Why did they fail? Let's watch them fail because we know it's going to happen. So, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> cool. congratulations, man! What's and then, where can we? Where can we hear your music? Um, well, Daisy's the only song I have out right now. I think it's on all platforms. And then, yeah, and then keep keep uh, keep checking out. And there's going to be some stuff coming soon. Awesome. awesome. What, what's the partnership name with you and your brother? Do you have a team, or what, what's the name of the 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 directing team. Uh, it's TBD right now, but I mean, Pascal what guys, Brothers. What's your brother's name? It's Kingsley. Oh, Kingsley, that's right. Yeah. Okay. He's probably watching, so. Where, where can we watch <laughs> or hear about this film coming out? Um, So the where it's going to be screening at the Lemley in Pasadena. Oh, I think nice. we're going to get it maybe in April, Um, but yeah, I'll keep you guys posted and invite nice. everybody. Yeah. Yeah, love to come check it out. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank well, great. gosh, we're pretty much at the end of the show. Like, what a fun, fun. night, right? It's a fun and also, also, Callie's got a nice microphone. What is that? A lit, a lewit? <laughs> a lewit? <laughs> it's a lewit. Who has a lewit? lewit? He's got a lewit. That's Bro, cool. Lewit it up. Great show. You know, Greg and Jimmy, thank you. I oh, could talk to you guys rock and roll all night. Well, we do every time we go for a hike, Stephen. That's true. That's true. That's right. So let's let's check in with Jimmy. What do you got coming up? Tell us what's going on. You know, what? I, I have a, a one page thing that I put everything down. So I'm going to post it. I, ju I just post it on my page and I'll send you guys a link. And it just has everything that's going on in my world for, for the time being. But 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 this is really what the thing that I, I'm trying to get this out of my mouth every time. If uh, this is just to everybody, um, if you can't help somebody don't hurt somebody. That's it. That's like, you know, everything that I've been doing lately in my life, I feel like I just got to put that out there in the universe, out of my mouth. I, I just want to be able to say that. Love rock and roll. Love you guys. I love business and success. But honestly, if you just can't, if you can't help somebody, don't hurt somebody. That's where I'm at in my life today. So that's why I, I want to say that. That's it. That's good awesome. job, man. That's good. And that's I'd, awesome. I'd love to just say, you know, my thoughts are with Ukraine right now and yeah. wishing that, yes. that this wasn't happening. Yeah. And it just doesn't make sense in our world today that this kind of stuff is happening and it just doesn't make sense. So thoughts and prayers to, to, to what's going on over there. It's a, right. Right. Not a good and, and, and Greg, tell us what, what, tell us what you're doing in Tulsa and what's coming up for you next. Yeah. I, um, you know, I am going to uh, start to really ramp up on a, a new book. I'm not ready to announce what it is yet, but that's my next, Nice. My next uh, project, yeah, is going to be uh, something I think it's going to be uh, going to be fun to write, and uh, yeah, it's uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. Hopefully, with the COVID COVID world, that really kind of uh, has thrown I think a lot of people's life into some, some sort of uh, upside yeah. down one way or the other. And uh, so, looking forward to better days ahead. That's awesome, and you know, just call me if you're ready to write any of these guys here their book on this show. I'll take your call. We'll figure it out. <laughs> I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> yes, I think it'd be very interesting. Um, okay, so David Moss, you want to take us out with that? Uh, fine. Uh, well, we've got another scene. show coming up in on March 10th. Do we have our guest, Kenny? You want to talk about who our guest is coming up on March 10th? Kenny, Kenny, <laughs> you booked him. Turn your mic on. <laughs> <laughs> Caught you, Kenny. Katya. Oh, I, I got to unmute. Sorry about that. <laughs> Give me a hint. You, want, you need a hint or are you good? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I forgot to unmute after we were listening to Kayla and wonder if no one could hear me talking. I, I was trying to ask Jimmy about uh, Pat Travers. <laughs> <laughs> and no one could hear me. I'm like, why is no one listening to me? <laughs> well, we have, to, we have to give full disclosure, Kenny. Kenny is on, he landed in LAX, at LAX. He's been in his car. We can't see him at all. Uh, and I, 
car because I can't get GPS to your place or anywhere <laughs> where I'm going because GPS and being FaceTime or I mean on Zoom right now. So <laughs> right, I'm, right. Trying, I'm trying to light up the car, but all I can <laughs> do is like, I'm go away with a lighter. Be like, <laughs> don't burn hey, the house Kenny, down, Kenny. Hey, Kenny, just you, uh, a quick, quickly. Pat Travers was freaking dude. It was literally like seeing him back in the day, dude. He played phenomenal. He sang great, and I happened to go up because I had to to go because yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, I'm a wannabe guitarist, wannabe bassist, all that stuff. And I went to look at his settings on his head, on his Marshall top, bass zero, treble zero. Present zero, mid ten. Those are his wow. settings. I was like, "Oh my god, that's fucking epic, dude!" <laughs> <laughs> when you said that earlier, I was um, I just flew in from Detroit last night, and you know, Detroit loves Pat Travers, and I yep. stopped to have a bite to eat at this friends of mine place at their little uh, bar they have there, and um, they said, "Kenny, what do you want to hear?" And I, I was just you know being Detroit and around a lot of these old school, and I said, "I want to hear." Some Pat Travers, and we listened to Snort Whiskey and Boom Boom Ooh. Ugly last night while I ate dinner. In yeah. a, in a awesome. And you brought it up. Boom <laughs> Whiskey! That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Make it go, okay. That's it. great. That's but great. Uh, so, so, yeah, we got uh, now with our guest next week, which I uh, could, uh, didn't you say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm confused with the one. Okay. You know, Rowan Marley. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Jamaica. That's yeah. the hint. No, no, no. Next week is left, leftover salmon and we'll oh, try. Right. <laughs> my, my bad. My right. bad. Here I am throwing throwing I Kenny was... under the bus, and I'm the one that booked next week. Yeah, so exactly. I can't remember who the guest exactly. is. So there, I there you go. Oh, he wants to do it. He's doing April 7th. We got Vince Herman from Leftover Salmon on the next show and Will Champlin, right? Will, Willie boy. Will Champlin is going to be our musical guest next week. Yeah. He's, so. a ba- he's a band member in Think. Yeah. So yeah. he's incredible. He's oh, an yeah. incredible yeah. musician. Yes. And his and dad listen. is who? Uh, Bill, Bill Champlin. Champlin. Yeah. One of my, my all time favorites. That band, Sons of Champlin, when I was growing up, was Amazing. one of my favorite bands, man. Yep. That I booked Sons Bill. of Champlin up in Humboldt County. Yeah. Uh, and it was like one of the short periods of time where they got back together. And it was just such an amazing, oh. amazing show. We thought we thought Mick Gillette, rest in peace, was literally right. having a heart attack in the middle of the show because he came off stage from blowing and he was like sitting there with chest pain and shortness of breath. And he absolutely would not let us call. We were getting ready to call anyway. We gave him oxygen sitting in between the song, like in the middle of the set. He's oh, like, shit. I'm fine. Gets back up there, continues to blow. And, you know, there you go Live for a while after there. But man, it might some- have been that blow. Yeah. You know, blow. Uh, yeah. You know, you know, you know, it's a heart, uh, heart condition. You don't want to do blow. All right. <laughs> yeah. Just, come on. All right. Let's, all right. Let's take it back. back. You, you I, I'm gonna I, hand I, off I to you, you, Sheila. She was blowing, not hey, doing Sheila? blow. I thought, like, I just blew his cover. <laughs> you like, oh, like he was blowing, not doing blow. What the hell? Well, you know, well, I was doing blow, and then he felt his heart. He was, he was like, building what's pressure doing? up. He was building pressure up inside you know, his body. I, I, I just went through an old trip. Like a whiskey and drinking cocaine. (laughs) (laughs) I I went to a church that someone wants to renovate and turn into like a venue. And we were down in the basement and they have a room signed right on the door. says organ blower room. (laughs) (laughs) Well, everyone, this is truly the rock and talk show. If you've never heard it before, you're going to hear it. uh, What else do we got, Sheila? (laughs) (laughs) It's all right here. Yes. Sheila, I want to I want to say one quick Ted Templeman story because this is yeah. one of my favorites as well. Um, we were mixing the second Bullet Boys record, and we happened to have a moment where we were walking outside to the cars together because all our cars, you know, in the studio, we all park in the same place. And we're I'm sidled up next uh-huh. to Ted Templeman, and I said to Ted, I go, uh, "Hey Ted, I go, is it possible that we put the drums louder in the mix?" And, and Ted had this thing that he did because he has, he has very thin and wispy hair. And he, every time you're about to get bad news, he would move his hair to the side. <laughs> and, and so I says, I said, Teddy, I go, can we put the drums louder in, in the mix? And he goes, 
Well, Jimmy, when they start humming drum lines in the elevator, I'll put the drums louder. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Awesome. Well, hey, hey Jimmy! Oh, hey Jimmy! Oh, really, That's really quick! I, re really quick! One more, one more to take us out with the. Uh, I, I love the story you told, which I think Steve and everyone else will appreciate. Is that Ted was a drummer growing up and hopped on your drums a few times and worked with you. Well, what yeah. happened was that this is like one of the heavy. I, I literally had to get off this session and call my dad. But um, the late Bobby Lakind, who was the the percussionist for the Doobie Brothers, sure. so heavy. Um, Okay, so uh, Bullet Boy's making a song. We're, we're tracking the day of, and it's a song that's very simple, but there's two per percussive parts going on simultaneously. And Ted Templeman hits the stop and goes, hold on, gets on a call, and then Bobby Lakine, who lives in the area, drives in, and they have percussion for him there. Actually, they have almost Stephen Lomi, his, his gong guys here. So they're gong guys right there, and Templeman's on the other side. So Bobby Lakine's on my right side, Ted Templeman's on my left side, and Ted's doing cowbell and 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 some some type of rock block shaker, and these guys are working together. And I sat back and I was like, "Holy shit!" It was literally because I forgot Ted Templeman was a great drummer in his band Harper's Bazaar. So oh, I'm sitting there in between wow. the drummer from the uh, percussionist from the Doobie Brothers and Ted Templeman playing, and I'm the I'm the drummer playing the middle of it. It was yeah. literally it was so heavy. I had to call my wow. dad after. It was nice. incredible. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome story. That's awesome. I would have to call my mommy. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy's, oh, daddies, whatever your thing is, right? Whatever. <laughs> Do we have anything else that we need to say before we close it out? No, we're just going to say tune in to the Rock and Talk Show on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, C Suite, all the platforms, Spotify, iHeart, everywhere. Check us out. And thank you so much, you guys, for being here. Thank on. you, guys. You Thank guys don't you. go away just yet. Don't go away. Hang tight for a sec. See you next time on the Rock and Talk Show Beyond Backstage with your hosts, Norwood Bishop, Kenny Olson, Scott Page, Stephen Perkins, Sheila Conlon, and David Moss. Executive producers, Sheila Conlon and David Moss. Producer and director, Eric Lloyd. Assistant producer and creative director, Mark Armentano. Editor, Graham Cooper. Theme music by Big X. Sponsors, IK Multimedia and Lewitt Microphones. Artist Relations, TPI Film. Special thanks to From the Earth, ThinkX, The Conlon Company, and Mac. Check us out on YouTube slash The Rock 